My name is Jim Goddard. I'm the grandson of Carl Gonnison, who was in the Canadian Mounted Artillery and was decorated with the Military Cross uh, in Canada for bravery in, during World War I. I'm also the great, 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 great grandson of Nan Yahi, a woman who was decorated in the battle between the Cherokee and the Creeks. She was given the honor of Gigayu, which is the uh, person who decides the fate of captives in war. And I introduce myself that way today because we have a very special Veterans Day uh, honor that we're going to uh, have going in just a minute. But first of all, instead of doing our pledge first, we're going to do our four-way test, which reminds me, reminds all of us of our ethics in business and in life. Please join me. Of the things we think, say, or do, is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be fair to all concerned? And at this time, I'd like to introduce Bill Houston, who will be uh, doing a special introduction for uh, Veterans Day. Bill, would you like to come to the stage? Bill is also past president and U.S. captain in the U.S. Marines. Bill? Uh, please be seated, everybody. I'm very honored to represent the veterans of our United States services. I thought I would begin with a mini history of Veterans Day. World War I began on July 28, 1914, and it's had very little publicity, but actually this is the 100th year anniversary of World War I. World War I was known as the war to end all wars. It was also known as the War of Trenches. They sat in trenches with mud and rain and so on for months, fighting each other at long distance. There were over 900,000 people killed in World War I. And interestingly, the United States of America did not get involved in World War I until 1917. And in 1917, we were involved until the end, which was 1919. On the 11th day of the 11th month of 1919, there was a treaty drawn called the Treaty of Versailles. And this was uh, drawn with all the parties that were in World War I. At the time, President Woodrow Wilson was the current president and he made the statement that we want to set up a thing called Armistice Day, which is to recognize the tragedies of war and the people that paid the price in that war. In 1994, Congress changed that name, and the name became Veterans Day. And so on the 11th day of every year, there's a recognition for all veterans that served honorably in the United States services. This year, because of Branch Rickey next week, and also Veterans Day is next Tuesday, we as the club are recognizing Veterans Day today. What we will do is ask each branch of the service to come in, I'm going to give a many, many history and purpose for that branch. And then we'll ask each member of the branch to stand as their hymn is played. And then we'll recognize all veterans. And then we'll all stand and do the Pledge of Allegiance. I'd like to start with the United States Air Force. Actually, the Army began flying in early as 1907. And they flew uh, clear until 19, from 1926 until after World War II. It was known as the Army Air Corps. In 1947, the U.S. Air Force was created to take command of air and space. Militarily, their, mo their charge, and it's so important in fighting for peace, is air superiority. So their success in air superiority 
and space is from the reason for the United States Air Force. Welcome, gentlemen. I'm honored. Second, the United States Army. The United States Army is the oldest branch of the service, founded as the Continental Army under George Washington. And the U.S. Army actually fought in the Revolution, and we know that story, and we became the independent United States of America. The Army was formed on June 14, 1775, and it might be worth a recall that June 14th is still Flag Day every, every year. The purpose of the Army is the defense of America and her liberties, and their primary charge is to effect military land operations. Third is the United States Coast Guard. The United States Coast Guard began as the Merchant Marines and was later named as the Coast Guard. It's the chief agency for protecting life and property at seas. They have three charges. Enforce maritime laws, protect ships and shores of America, and rescue victims at sea. Next, the United States Marine Corps. The Marine Corps was founded at Tun Tavern, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, on November 10, 1775. Next Monday is the 239th birthday of the United States Marine Corps. The Marine Corps has fought in every single war that the United States has been involved in since 1775. You'll hear the term Semper Fidelis. What Semper Fidelis is, is it's a creed that every Marine follows, which is always faithful to the Corps. Last and not least, the United States Navy. Its charge is to provide sea power around the world. The way our current Navy is established, we can, can bring force for the name of peace against any country within a matter of about hours through our sophisticated systems of aircraft carriers, airplanes, and etc. Part of the Navy is a, uh, an organization we know very well called the SEALs. SEAL stands for Sea, Air, and Land SEALs. And we know about the SEALs. They're a department of the Navy. Part of holding world power and world peace is a strong Air Force, a strong amphibious force, and a strong Navy. Doug, first of all, I'd like to to recognize the members present and any that might be in the audience in the United States Air Force. Next, please recognize the United States Army. Next, anybody in the house that's a member of the United States Coast Guard, please stand. Uh, next, but anybody that's a United States Marine, please stand and be recognized. And certainly last but not least, the United States Navy. Let's all please stand and pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. I pledge allegiance 
to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Ladies and gentlemen, represented here are five national services that exist in the name of peace around the world. Thank you. Thank you, Bill, and thanks everyone for uh, recognizing our veterans. We have a wonderful program coming up that will relate as well. Please enjoy your lunch and fellowship. I always love that. Okay, um, and John Altland <laughs> is visiting again from Golden. John, nice to see you again. You're going to have to transfer your membership. Okay, yay. Give him another round of applause. He's transferring his membership. <laughs> Okay, and Juan Jose Pena Herrera is a guest of Scott White. He's an exchange student. Juan Jose, could you stand up? Nice to have you. And then we have Maury Hecox, who is a guest of Ed Heath. Maury, are you here? Welcome. And then Ralph Penke is a guest of Phil. Ralph, nice to have you. And I don't think Tom Cunningham made it. Is he here? No. Okay, great. Now to our announcements. A reminder, this Saturday, November 8th, is an opportunity for Rotarians from across the district to help put lions back together again after the devastating floods last year. Volunteers will be working on, the build on rebuilding the plaza in front of the town hall. Volunteers are needed to work this Saturday. Um, there are morning and afternoon shifts, and if you would like to volunteer, um, you can go ahead and visit lionsrotary at me.com, and I believe that was in our Tuesday blast if you need to go back and look for that email address. Um, finally, we are in desperate need of fellowship hosts for December 11th, so if you would like to host a fellowship meeting, please contact um, Darlene or Lauren. Now for our mission moment this week, I'd like to highlight the Scholastic Art Awards. The mission of this organization is to provide creative teens, 7th through 12th grade, with opportunities to exhibit and showcase their exceptional artistic talent, to award college scholarships, and to guide their career development. Last year, over 312 teachers entered over 4,200 pieces of art in the statewide competition. I know I always look forward to our lunch that we have at the Denver Art Museum in March, where we get to meet the artists. It's wonderful to, to hear about their plans for the future. Um, specifically, the Club 31 Foundation this year approved an $8,000 grant, which will be used to secure more large venues for the artists to showcase their work. It will also be used to cover the individual entry fees for students who qualify for free reduced lunch. So this really does enable a lot more students to participate in this wonderful program. If you'd like to get more involved, um, you can certainly um, speak to Rotarian Todd Bacon. Todd, wave your hand so everybody knows. Todd's over here today, so you can talk to him about that. Thank you, and enjoy your lunches. Thank you, Christy. And now we have two new member introductions. First, we'll have Lonnie Langton, Director of Business Development, uh, with Action Coach to introduce Danae Woody, and then Carter Sales, will, uh, a Business Development Manager at Telecom Technicians, will introduce Justin Montgomery. First of all, Lonnie. Thank you. I wanted to introduce Danae Woody. She came one year ago at the Clifford Stills Museum event that Rotary hosted. And since then, she's become a client and a fast friend of mine. 
Danae has been to many Rotary events as my guest, so you may have met her. And for those who have not met her, I'm excited to have the opportunity to introduce her. Danae is a family law attorney in Colorado who opened her own firm April of this year, as well as an avid Broncos fan. Go Broncos. <laughs> There's one fan over there. <laughs> Danae holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in Psychology, and she also um, Juris Doctor from University of Denver. She's also involved with efforts in her community to help people for justice for the public that have modest means. She regularly speaks at the Bar Association events, law schools, and anyone who will listen about the passion of hers to help others. Another one of her passions is mentoring young attorneys and law students. We will hopefully learn something new every day and can never have enough mentors. Therefore, she considers her job a part of her job and calling as a lawyer herself to assist the training of young generation of lawyers. When Danae isn't running her law practice, mentoring or presenting, she enjoys volunteering with Metro Volunteer Lawyers, providing pro bono services to clients, tutoring elementary school children with reading partners, and she also helps out with the Food Bank of the Rockies with me. Also, when she can find time, which I know she does, Danae enjoys skiing and traveling with her husband. In fact, Sunday they just returned from a trip from London and Paris. So Danae Woody, I'd like to introduce you. Good afternoon, everyone, uh, Rotarians and guests. Today, I am very pleased to introduce our newest member with the bright, shiny, new red badge, Justin Montgomery. Justin grew up in Topeka, Kansas, and he went to University of Kansas. His first degree was in philosophy, and when he graduated in 2006, he figured out that maybe there wasn't as much demand as he thought for somebody with a degree in philosophy. So he decided, okay, I, I'm going to stay in school. He went into the urban planning curriculum and graduated with a master's degree in urban planning in 2008. Got a job in Albuquerque, New Mexico as an urban planner. Well, as you know, in 2008 started our Great Recession. So he lasted about, I think it was two years before he was downsized in that, in that particular job. Well, he ended up then in Las Vegas, and he was a valet parking attendant for the Cosmopolitan Hotel that had just opened. One of the customers had lost their cell phone. Justin had heard about that. He searched all over the hotel lobby, found the cell phone, kept it safe, and personally delivered it to that customer. Well, that customer... Um, his name was David Douglas, and he actually owned a parking company that has parking operations from California to North Carolina. So he gave him his business card, and he was also the past president and very active Rotarian of the club that's located in uh, Oakland, California, which is Rotary Club number three. So obviously, Mr. Douglas, when he gave him his card, he noticed something about Justin that exemplified service above self. And he said, you know, if you want to further your career and, and have some other opportunities in this business, call me. Well, Justin did that, and he, he, he now works for Douglas Parking, and he's the Director of Business Development and Special Projects. He was just relocated here to Denver, and it's been a lifelong dream of his to move here to Denver. So uh, he's joined by his girlfriend, Phoebe, and his rescue Boston Terrier dog, Rocky. And the other thing that Mr. Douglas said is he says, I strongly suggest that you get involved in Rotary. So he took his advice there again as well. So I'm very pleased to be introducing Justin here. I know he can talk to you about philosophy. He can talk to you about urban planning and probably about parking. So I encourage you to get to know him. 
He's really looking forward to uh, getting involved in our service through Rotary. May I introduce Justin Montgomery. Welcome. Thank you, Carter. Thank you, Carter. Uh, it's my honor as president of the Rotary Club of Denver to welcome Justin Montgomery and Danae Woody to Rotary. Justin and Danae, Rotary is a worldwide organization of business and professional leaders who provide humanitarian service, encourage high ethical standards in all vocations, and help build goodwill and peace. You've been invited to join the Rotary Club of Denver, Denver to become a member of the service organization that has true impact around the globe. You were selected because you hold in common with our members the values of service, leadership, integrity, fellowship, and diversity. We invite you to get engaged, which I know you already are, in service opportunities and start networking with fellow Rotarians. Once you take those actions, you will discover the true essence of Rotarians, people who place service above self. Thank you for making this decision to begin your Rotary journey with Denver Club 31. It's now our role to engage your passion and together we must focus our efforts so that our club can reach its maximum potential. Thank you Carter and Lonnie for inviting and inspiring Justin and Danae. Fellow Rotarians, please stand and help me welcome our newest members, Justin Montgomery and Danae Woody. Thank you both very much. Now I'm going to introduce Charlie Miller, partner of Miller and Ertz, uh, to give us an update on the Branch Rickey Award. Charlie? Good afternoon, Denver Rotary. Oh. And I hope that you'll get enthusiastic. There's only one week uh, and one day before the um, largest fundraiser that we have for our club the Branch Rickey Award Banquet and Extra Innings Party. It will be uh, Friday, November 14th at the McNichols uh, Civic Center building. It's a new location, the corner of, of uh, Colfax and Bannock. We, there will be valet parking and uh, if you order it in advance it's only 10 bucks for the valet parking. If you don't have your tickets yet, get busy. You got, uh, we have to give a count tomorrow to our caterer, and we hope that we have your names uh, when we include that count. We have uh, good ticket sales to the, the banquet, and it will be a fun evening uh, honoring Anthony Rizzo of the Chicago Cubs. Um, there are a few things to, uh, that I want to remind you about, though. New location, the time, it's a, new, it's a Friday night, not a Saturday night, so we will start at 5.30 with cocktails and the silent auction. There are some terrific silent auction items uh, that you'll want to make sure you bring a buck or two for. And uh, there will also be the wall of wine, and we still need some, uh, uh, some more bottles of wine contributed, so that's another possibility for you. Also, I want to remind you that we have a match this year. If two-thirds of our membership participates in the Branch Rickey Award Banquet, we will get an additional $10,000 for our Denver Rotary Club Foundation from uh, our title sponsor, AMG National Trust Bank. We thank Earl Wright for that challenge. And now we have to, to get ourselves to meet that challenge. Uh, if you, again, if you don't have your tickets, uh, then get them online, branchrickyaward.org. Contact the Rotary office. Um, for the extra innings party after the, um, after the banquet, those tickets are only $75 at this point. So um, we hope that you will uh, come and attend that. If you buy the $250 ticket to the banquet, it will include the, a ticket to the extra innings party. Um, all of the proceeds will go to the Denver Rotary Club Foundation. And there will be a paddle raised. 
And we have one of our members who's uh, uh, made a generous contribution to, to match um, up to, up to uh, $4,500 at the paddle race. So we hope that you will be able to participate in that. So, um, I do have a request from uh, Darlene that if you are able to be there uh, uh, to help, she needs some help at the registration table. That will be starting at 5.30, so if you can get there around 5, she needs three people. See Darlene before you leave today if you can be one of those three people. Um, the emphasis this year would be that it's different and it's going to be fun, particularly the extra innings party. Our cohort and uh, some, uh, a committee, a work group has just been terrific in putting all of the extra innings party together. And I guarantee you, you will have some fun at that party if you can be there. So get signed up, get your tickets. If you're able to, um, to volunteer for the registration table, see Darlene. And we'll see all of you, at least two-thirds of our club, please, so we can get that match uh, one week from tomorrow. 5.30, McNichols Event Center. See you there. Thank you, Charlie. I can't tell you how much work Charlie's put into this, and it, I can't tell you how important this event is to our foundation. I look forward to being there. My sons are really looking forward to taking a peek into that after party. Unfortunately, they can't stay because they're not 21. Now I'd like to introduce Virgil Scott, principal of Virg Virg Virgil Scott Consulting, who is here to uh, honor a special bequest today. Thank you, President Jim. Today we recognize the generosity of two club members who are new members of the Rotary Foundation's Bequest Society. The special recognition is bestowed upon those who make gift commitments in their estate plan of $10,000 or more to the Rotary Foundation's Endowment Fund. Joining me today to honor the new Bequest Society members is Rotary District 5450 Foundation Chair, Ann Tull. Thanks for being here, Ann. Rotary's impact on our world is no secret. It is through the Rotary Foundation, the charitable arm of Rotary, that gifts are transformed into projects that change and enrich lives, both close to home and around the world. The state gifts to the Foundation's Endowment Fund provide ongoing financial support in perpetuity. It's pretty cool. It's like making an annual com contribution every year forever. Today's honorees, please come forward, Sue Fox and Jim Mack, have been leading the way for the rest of us for decades. During their tenure with our club, Sue and Jim have been leading by example in so many ways. That virtue today continues as they make personal commitments of their resources through estate planning. Okay. Sue Fox has been a club member since 2001. She was president of our club in 2008 and 9 and is a Denver Rotary Club Foundation Silver Fellow, a Denver Rotary Club Foundation Legacy Society Charter member, and a Paul Harris Fellow plus two. <laughs> Let's show our appreciation. Thank you. Thank you. Jim Mack has been a club member since 1985. He was president of our club in 1999-2000. He was our foundation's president in 1996 and 7. Jim is a Denver Rotary Club Foundation Gold Fellow and a Paul Harris Fellow plus eight. Thank you, Jim. There are flyers on each table today titled Your Rotary Legacy. These flyers include information on bequest society recognition, have sample bequest language for making an estate gift, and include a form to inform the foundation should you desire to make such a gift yourself. If you would like to personally visit with someone directly about this type of giving, you are welcome to visit with Ann today, our club's Rotary Foundation Support Committee Chair, Don Lewis, myself, or probably even best, 
you are welcome to visit with Sue and or Jim. They are willing to share their testimony of why and how they made their gifts, and I encourage you to do so. I know so many of you know them, so please take advantage of that opportunity. It doesn't have to be today. It can be, be any time. Also, I'd like to express appreciation to all those Club 31 members who have previously joined the Bequest Society. Jim and Sue bring that number up to 13 members. Thank you very much. Additionally, Benefactor is another recognition level for estate gifts to the foundation. Benefactors have made estate gift commitments of any amount. Through the years, 21 club members have received such recognition. Thanks to all of you for your foresight, your generosity, and for the positive impact your legacy will have on our community and our world. Thank you. Thank you, Virgil. Now I'd like to introduce uh, or have Bob Levers, President and CEO of the Samaritan Inst Institute, introduce our speaker today, Bob. Now, President Jim and uh, Rotarians, it's my pleasure to introduce for our Veterans Day celebration uh, Dr. Tom Yuckow. He's a professor of aeronautical engineering at the United States Air Force Academy. He has an earned doctorate in engineering degree in aerospace engineering from the University of Kansas. We have anybody from the University of Kansas here? All right, got a few. There you go, Tom. <clears throat> he is also um, he is also involved with the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, astronautics uh, as an fe associate fellow. More importantly, he is an Air Force veteran with 25 years of service, which included development and flight testing of the the F-111, the A-7 aircraft, the F-4 Phantom, and with extensive experience with the design, development, and flight testing of the A-10, which is the subject of his presentation today. I will tell you that Tom is the recipient of numerous awards, including the NASA Outstanding Achievement Award, the Frank Schuyler Award for Research Excellence, and the Heisler Award as the Outstanding United States Air Force Academy Professor and educator. He is also honored as a Carnegie Foundation 211 Colorado Professor of the Year. In addition, he has served as the principal investigator for numerous wind tunnel investigation programs, holds the patent on the Reichelt wingtip modification on aircraft, and has authored over 200 technical publications. Uh, but most important to me, Tom, He's my friend, and uh, we go biking together, bicycling, not biking together. So I introduce to you and present to you Tom Yuckow for our presentation. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. My goodness, Bob, the best part of that introduction was the last part. I'm your friend. Close to the mic. What an honor. Let's try this one. That's probably better. What an honor and privilege to be here with uh, the Rotary Club. Let me congratulate you for all of the wonderful work that you do with the community and your spirit of giving back. That's the, uh, the spirit that we try to instill at the Air Force Academy. Too close? How's that? Okay, we'll do better. <laughs> okay, what, uh, what I would like to do today is give you just a snapshot of an airplane that uh, I had the privilege of working with over the years during my Air Force career and actually even my post Air Force career. But the presentation will not be given by exactly the person that Bob introduced. It'll be given by a young captain about 40 years ago that happened to fall into a very special job. And that was leading the flight test of the ugly duckling aircraft that didn't quite have the favor of the Air Force like the F-15, the F-16, and some of the other airplanes. Well, I think I was the only one available to maybe do that job, but it turned out uh, to be a wonderful life experience. Okay, 
So, the A-10, I realize that many of you are not that familiar with airplanes, uh, but I would like you to at least walk out of here knowing a little bit more about this wonderful airplane. You can see a picture of it up there. The uh, A-10 is a close air support airplane. So what does that mean? Well, let's see if we have the range here. There we go. Okay, close air support. That's providing firepower to our ground troops, Army and Marines, in close proximity that are engaged in close proximity to the enemy. How did we get the A-10? That's probably your first question. Out of the Vietnam experience, we identified the need for a close air support airplane that had better capabilities than anything that we had in the inventory. At the same time that that was happening, the Soviet Union was building up tremendous ground forces. They had a four to one advantage in tanks over the United States at that time. So the requirements were combined into the concept of let's mount the most powerful cannon ever developed in the world, really, on an aircraft that could destroy tanks but also provide close air support. The AX competition kicked off in the late uh, 60s, and the two finalists were the Northrop Corporation with the A9 and the Fairchild Republic Corporation with the A-10. Let's take a little closer look at those airplanes. The Northrop A-9 was a very conventional airplane. You can see the high wing, the single vertical tail, the engines nacelled and integrated into the fuselage. On the other hand, the A-10 was very unusual. And for those, just out of curiosity, how many have ever seen an A-10? Oh, well, that's more than I expected. Fantastic. Okay. Um, very unconventional. The engines are potted in the cells on the aft part of the fuselage. Okay. It was a low-wing design, and it had twin vertical tails, harking back to the B-24 and B-25 of World War II. Very unconventional. And uh, some people, not me, would uh, maybe refer to it as being ugly because it was so unconventional. The requirements on these airplanes are stated there. Simply, it had to be lethal. It had to be able to kill tanks and provide close air support. It had to be survivable. And as we're going to see, the A-10 is probably the most survivable airplane that we've ever built. Okay, it had to be maintainable, which means simple, and it had to be responsive. And one of the unique features that distinguishes the A-10 from any other airplane is its loiter time. It can loiter over the battlefield for up to two hours. Uh, it carries enough fuel to perform that and be responsive to the ground troops. And it had to be low cost. If you can believe this, in today's world, way back when I was associated with the airplane, the design to cost on the airplane was $1.4 million. Now, that, I know that seems like a lot depending on where you're coming from, but it's nothing when you look at military airplanes. There was a fly-off. I was part of that fly-off, and the A-10, the ugly duckling, emerged as the winner for a lot of good reasons. And we're going to try to give you a snapshot on what those were today. But your first question is probably, why does it look like that? Okay. Well, the first thing we'll talk about is the gun. And there's only one, the gun, in the Air Force. And that's the GAO-8. 30 millimeter Gatling gun. Okay, it, uh, it's a gun capable of firing 60 rounds per second. The uh, a very high speed trajectory, and the gun itself, with the ammo drum, weighs about 4,000 pounds, and it's about 20 feet long. Compared up there to the Volkswagen, you can get an idea of how big that gun is. Well. 
In order to mount that gun, the airplane had to be designed around the gun. In fact, some people refer to the airplane as a holster for the gun. The, uh, you can see how the gun is integrated into the airplane. The bullets that it fires, uh, compared to a beer bottle, the bullets the whole, and casing are over a, over a foot long. They can penetrate the heaviest armor on a tank, and we use a mix of armor piercing and high incendiary explosive ammo in order to destroy basically any type of armor or artillery. But why are the engines placed on the back end? Fighter airplanes don't do that. Well, there's several good reasons. First of all, I want you to look at where the barrel of the gun is up in the nose of the airplane and where the intakes of the engines are. Let me see if I can get this to work. Notice that there's a good distance between that. And the reason that there needs to be is that this gun puts out a tremendous amount of gun smoke and engines don't like gun smoke. They'll flame out if, uh, if that happens. With the A-10's design, about two-thirds of the gun smoke goes under the wing and about a third goes over the wing, but it's got that distance to mix with air so that the engines stay running. Another very important feature is that the engines are completely separated from the fuel cells in the airplane. In fact, if you have an engine fire, you can let the engine basically burn off the airplane and it'll stay flying. Okay, with any other fighter airplane, an engine fire that you can't put out is typically a bailout. Another reason. Notice the location of the engines relative to the wing. The wing shields the engine intakes from ground debris that might be kicked up by the landing gear. This is especially important to meet a requirement for being able to operate the airplane off of rough fields and deteriorating runways. And it's the only airplane over in the Middle East that we've been able to operate off those kind of deteriorating runways. To illustrate that, Notice this view of the airplane and how the wing shields the engines. Finally, you might wonder about the dual vertical tail configuration. Okay, it forms a box. What is the advantage of that? Well, there's several advantages of that. First of all, if you get one of the vertical tails blown off, the engine maintains directional stability. In other words, it can fly and keep the pointy end into the wind, okay? Only airplane that I know of that can do that. But more than that, the box that's formed by the horizontal tail and the vertical tail, if you think about the hot spot on the airplane that an IR missile would seek, focus your eyes as I hold up this model on the engine exhausts, okay? And as the airplane maneuvers and jinks, what happens to your line of sight? Is it blocked by the box that the horizontal and vertical tail form? Yes. Okay, so a couple of uh, very nice uh, results of going with that design. Okay, well, before I leave this slide, I want to tell one quick story. And that is, in development of this airplane, during the initial flight test program, we had a, several big challenges, but one of them was that we wanted to be able to make this airplane stay controllable if you lost all of your hydraulic systems, okay? That would be like driving an 18-wheel Mack truck without any steering, but just give you a couple of cables to move those front wheels, okay? The uh, way we did that was with a unique manual reversion system, where if all of the hydraulic systems were lost, the airplane can be flown on just cables and push rods and pulleys, something like a little Cessna, okay? But this is a big airplane, 
that has very heavy control forces. One of the reasons I don't have a lot of hair is we really had a tough challenge to make that work on a big airplane like this. But one of the smartest things that we did was when we chose our test pilot for this program, we chose the smallest, lightest, I don't want to say weakest, no test pilot is weak, but least strong test pilot to develop this system because we couldn't really predict who would ever need to use it, what size pilot. Okay, well, armed with that, let's go to the next slide and take a look at a couple airplanes that have illustrated how tough the airplane really is. During Gulf War I, a pilot named Captain Paul Johnson brought back an airplane after taking a SAM hit over Iraq, the airplane that's shown here. And I, I don't know if you can see that very clearly, but basically the entire leading edge of the airplane has been blown off. One of the many unique features of the A-10 is that it has three main spars in each wing. Most airplanes only have two. The A-10 was designed so that any one of those spars could be severed and the airplane would still maintain wing in integrity. However, Paul Johnson showed that the airplane was even stronger than that. He brought this airplane back with basically two spars severed. He brought it back on one spar. Here you get a little idea of the damage from the front and also from the front. But the thing that pleases me the most is that the reason he was able to bring it back was because of that manual reversion system that we worked so hard to make usable. During Gulf War II, Captain Kim Campbell took a SAM hit over Baghdad in the rear end of the airplane that knocked out both hydraulic systems and she had to switch to manual reversion. This is one of my favorite pictures. You see how big Kim Campbell is? She probably weighs about 115 pounds. Thank goodness we picked a small test pilot, okay? Because Kim Campbell was able to bring that airplane back on manual reversion. And a particularly uh, neat event for me in my life was that uh, shortly after that happened, Kim Campbell came by the Air Force Academy just to chat about development of the manual reversion system and how she was so thankful that it worked as advertised. You can see some more of the damage here on Kim's airplane. Well, I'll share with, with you a couple of development stories. As we take a look at the competitor for the A-10, the A-9, I want you to notice where the intakes are on the engine. Those were about three feet above the ground. We expressed a concern about that configuration to the program director, indicating that we felt the airplane would be very susceptible to foreign objects being sucked into the intakes. The intakes are like big vacuum cleaners. Well, the program director said, quantify it. Well, what does that mean to a young captain? Oh, yes, sir, we'll quantify it. I don't have any idea how to do it, but we'll quantify it. Well, we went back and thought, how can we do this? And what we came up with was what we called the cornflake test. We got three boxes of cornflakes, put them out in front of, oops, out in front of the intakes right out here, ran the engines up on the ground and recorded it with high-speed cameras. It was the most beautiful thing you ever saw. Cord flakes were sucked up right off the ground, went right through the uh, intakes, through the engines, and we saw little sparks coming out the back that we called post-toasties. <laughs> yeah. 
So we bundled all of that up, sent it to the SPO director, and do you know what he said? He said, if you did it on the A9, you got to do it on the A10. This is a competitive fly-off. So we did it on the A10. And you can imagine, not one cornflake twitched as we ran the engines up because of that unique configuration. Another interesting quick story concerns the leading edge of the airplane. I've shared with you several of the neat features of the A-10 and why the configuration looks the way that it does. But one of the big disadvantages of this configuration was identified after flight 15 when both engines flamed out during a high G turn. And if you notice on the the airflow has to go up and over the wing and then into the intakes. And what was happening was the stall on the wing was initiating and causing very disruptive flow to go into the intakes. This is like the flow that you might experience on the back of a minivan. Very separated flow, uh, us aero engineers call it. And that presents problems for fan jet engines, okay? In other words, they have trouble digesting it. So we went to the SPO director and identified this problem. And do you know how he reacted to it? He reacted with two words, fix it. <laughs> now, that seemed fairly trite to me at the time. But as I've thought about it over the years, I think it was a great leadership move because it expressed confidence in us in the test team and he realized that we were the closest to what was going on. Not that we weren't under a lot of pressure, okay. Well, how did we fix it? After several iterations, if you look closely at the airplane, you'll see a leading edge slat. And that leading edge slat right there basically provides a channel, something like a garden hose nozzle, to speed up the flow and keep it attached. And I'll share with you another of my favorite pictures. If you look closely, you'll see in this picture that the flow with the slat out is nice and smooth going into the intakes. Over here, the flow is separated. And over here, we still have good flow in order to keep the ailerons, the roll control uh, surfaces, in good flow. So the airplane is actually sort of a thing of beauty when you think about how we did that. OK, well, the top two pictures are probably the most feared thing that any of our enemies can see on the ground right now. The front end view of an A-10 with that big gun. Okay, the bottom picture is probably the best thing that our ground soldiers can see right now because they know they've got the A-10 to support them. I'll share with you one last story. I was on an airplane flight back from Atlanta to Colorado Springs and I sat next to a young Army captain. And I asked him, I said, have you ever served in the Middle East? And he said, yes, sir. I just returned two months ago. I was a company commander on the ground. And then I said, did you see any A-10s over there? And I can tell you this, I didn't have to say another word. For the next 20 minutes, he told me how great the A-10 was. And all I could do is feel very, very satisfied. So. With that, Darlene or whoever, do we have time for about a three and a half minute video or not? I don't know. I think we do. We do? Okay, Lauren, maybe you could trigger that. I want to show you one mission, just one of many, where the A-10 saved a lot of American lives.
You're looking through the eye of the gun camera as an A-10 warthog bears down on insurgents who have ambushed 90 coalition soldiers in eastern Afghanistan. They're now pinned down on a ridge line. It is the beginning of what was, by all accounts, one of the epic air-to-ground battles of the war. The A-10s are flying so low, enemy fire is punching holes in their aircraft. They return fire as thunderstorms roll through the valley. The lead A-10 is piloted by Lieutenant Colonel Paul Zerkowski, call sign Zuko. The enemy knew the weather was rolling in and they, they orchestrated an ambush. Though most of the footage is classified, the story of the 13-hour battle circulated quickly across Bagram Airfield when the Thunderbolts from the 104th Fighter Squadron made it back. Zuko, who is with the Maryland Air National Guard and his wingman Metro, faced withering enemy fire. As the visibility dimmed, winds came up and their fuel ran low. But if they turned back or deviated to refuel, there's little doubt the ambushed coalition forces would have taken heavy casualties. So Zuko and Metro dipped in and out of the valley, unleashing the hellfire of their 30mm Avenger 7-barrel Gatling guns. The weapon, which stretches half the length of the aircraft, fires 4,200 one-pound rounds per minute. It can cut an armored vehicle in half. The A-10's appearance and its signature sound when on the attack make it the most intimidating aircraft in the sky. It has a specific line, so they, they know it's the A-10. They can hear the airplane. The enemy tends to, tends to withdraw. But this time, they didn't, and Zuko unloaded everything he had. The first thing I did to, su to suppress the fires was do a show of force. I did three shows of force, followed by uh, a rocket pass to confirm that I had this, the correct area in sight of where the, uh, where the enemy was. And on that rocket pass, I received some uh, small arms fire that hit the tail of the airplane here. That's the prepare. And then it has also hit the speed brake panel over here. When Zuko instructed Metro to refuel at a KC-135 orbiting a half hour away, Zuko alone, above the enemy, kept firing and taking fire. The coalition forces had been split in the ambush. He had to choose his targets in near-zero visibility very carefully. He made increasingly difficult combat maneuvers, flying low and slow, emptying his Gatling gun. I was stretching the gas, providing the support they needed with the gun. Finally, another wave of A-10s was called in. Zuko, holding out as long as he could, made it back to base, flying on fumes. There were no serious injuries to coalition soldiers. We uh, were able to get all 90 troops out. There were a couple injuries. Very successful mission. Zuko, who in civilian life is a 777 captain for United Airlines and his wingman Metro, prevented what could have been one of the Afghan war's darkest days. Lauren, there we go. Maybe get to the next slide. What a privilege to be with you. I wanted to share uh, just two last thoughts. The first one is to all the veterans, thank you for your service. Obviously, uh, we all have unique sacrifices in our background. One of the things that really brought it home to me was about 10 years ago, I had the opportunity to be at Normandy for the uh, 60th anniversary of D-Day, and I was just walking around the cemetery, American Cemetery at St. Laurent, France. In fact, I was talking with Ann a little bit about that. And a gentleman tapped me on the shoulder and asked me if I was an American veteran. And when he found out that I was, he asked me to be part of the flag lowering ceremony that day. And I can tell you that two emotions ran through me. The first one was that the real heroes are the ones that gave it all. And at that cemetery in Normandy, France, there's over 9,000 GIs that gave it all. The second thing that hit me was I was extremely proud to be part of something this important and bigger than me. With that, Let me leave you with this. 
In my view of the world at the Air Force Academy, the future looks very bright for the type of military leaders that are coming up to re step in the footsteps of those that are getting up there in the years. Okay, I see these young people every day. They have integrity, they have service before self, and they strive for excellence in all they do. America is still producing probably the best youth of any country in the world. And with that, I thank you for listening today. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you very much. Well, it's a pleasure to have you here, and, and the significance of, of what you've done is, is very apparent. We have time for maybe just one question, uh, if we have a quick one. Yes, right in the back. That's absolutely accurate. It's a depressing thing to see uh, my Air Force uh, want to basically retire the A-10 right now, especially with uh, everything that's going on in the Middle East. Um, all I can say is the Air Force explanation is they have many roles to be responsible for and the A-10 tends to be a single mission airplane. However, unofficially, I will say that the A-10, as you allude to, has been under attack in the past and survived under attack from the funding standpoint and obviously under attack by our enemies and survived. So you're correct, it is Congress that's delaying the retirement of the A-10. You know, it may take another active engagement by the A-10 in a current conflict in order to extend its life. So that's about all I can say. Right. Well, What's the origin of the war bomb? I'm not sure anybody really knows. What's the origin of the name Warthog was the uh, question. Uh, I've heard several stories about it. What I think is probably the most accurate is that a young fighter pilot walked out to the airplane one day and said, that looks like a Warthog to me, and it stuck. <laughs> okay, thank